Hello there again wrestling fans. Hogan vs. Tenryu. Let's see what Uncle Dave had to say about it from the December 23, 1991 Wrestling Observer Newsletter. SWS slash WWF slash PWF slash CMLL Super Show with Hogan vs. Tenryu, more. By Observer Staff. Wrestling Observer Newsletter. December 23, 1991. Before starting out with the news, I want to take this time to wish all of you a Merry Christmas and a Happy Holiday Season. This is the final issue of 1991 and this has been both the most interesting and gratifying year in the history of this publication. It's the support of everyone like you that has made it all possible, and I can't thank you all enough. Because most of the major wrestling companies are closed down as far as running live events until Christmas, we'll be taking next week off from The Observer and come back with the first issue of 1992 the following week. The current plan is to do a regular issue for January 6th covering the shows from Christmas week, including Starcade 91, and then do a double issue after that which would finish the current set. The double issue may be mailed out a few days late. From that point on, everything will be back on our regular weekly Wednesday mailing schedule. This is the final reminder for mailing in the 1991 Wrestling Observer Awards. This is calculator time of the year here tallying up all the ballots and I don't want anyone who spends as much time as it takes thinking of winners and place winners in all the various categories to not have their ballots counted. Please mail by Christmas at the latest if you live outside of the United States and I'd recommend mailing before New Year's Day for those of you within the United States. Awards balloting will be closed for those of you wishing to send faxes as of Monday, January 6th. The results of the awards balloting will be released in the Observer shortly thereafter. In addition, for those of you in the past who have contributed top 50 ballots for the annual ratings, please send them in by that same time. I haven't had time to send out individual letters regarding the ratings. Topping off the news this week is the combined Super World Sports slash World Wrestling Federation slash Pro Wrestling Fujiwara EMLL show on December 12th at the Tokyo Egg Dome. The second combined show with the two promotions drew more than 40,000 fans to the dome, announced by SWS as 61,500, just over 30,000 of that is paid attendance which means the live gate should have been somewhere around the $1.5 million range, which naturally pleased everyone. Don't have much in the way of details on the show, although we should have a full report since the card aired on television this past Sunday in Japan, for the next issue with details on the matches. Of those I've talked with, the reports were mixed, basically that the crowd reactions were good for people like Hulk Hogan and the Legion of Doom who were given ovations similar to a rock star rather than a wrestler. It was not a typical Japanese wrestling crowd, since it was filled with freebies and they reacted less to wrestling moves as to just seeing the names they were familiar with. Unlike the first time the WWF was part of a Tokyo Dome show, the US and Japan Wrestling Summit show in 1990, this crowd wasn't augmented by thousands of freebies given out at the American military bases to ensure at least a measure of an American-style reaction to the WWF-style showmanship. Anyway, those who came to see Hogan do his thing were not disappointed, Although to the hardcore wrestling fans, the quality of matches I'm told was very bad for a show of this magnitude as I'm told there was only one match better than two and a half stars, and most were two stars or less. The show also featured no major surprises or news items, at least obvious to the fans. The biggest news item was behind the scenes in regard to the result of the Hulk Hogan vs. Genichiro Tenryu main event. Although all logic pointed to Tenryu winning, since Hogan doesn't hold a title, and most expect will be champion again at some point which would set up a natural return match with Hogan defending against Tenryu at the Dome which Hogan would have to win, plus Tenryu beating Hogan would have enough impact to significantly bolster the credibility of SWS and Tenryu as a whole, something the group badly needs since it is at best the number 4 and realistically farther down the ladder promotion in Japan as far as popularity, anyone familiar with the politics would know there wasn't a prayer in the world of that happening. Still it seemed the hardcore Japanese press the last few days going into the event believed Tenryu would win because it made sense. The majority of the fans expected Hogan to win because he hasn't done a job in Japan since around 1981, which was before he became a crossover celebrity worldwide. He already was a celebrity in Japan by that time. Anyway as the story goes Hogan arrived late for the show because he took the last plane out of Florida because his father was ill, and apparently Kabuki, one of the SWS bookers, told the reporters that could be trusted that everything was worked out with the WWF and that Tenryu was going to win, what the approximate time would be and the finishing sequence so they could write their stories up and get them to their morning newspapers in time to not break deadline. Because the Hogan-Tenryu match was to go on late, the time spent watching the match, then writing the story, it wouldn't make the morning papers, there were in excess of 100 reporters from around Japan covering the show. Well, as these reporters were faxing and phoning in their Dewey defeats Truman story, on the television monitor in the dome press room, Hogan pinned Tenryu after two clotheslines which caused a mass panic in the press room. 
Complete results of the show saw, 1. The opener was a tag team match involving four rookies, Hiroshi Hatanaka teaming with a guy named Kawabata to beat Nakahara and Hirai, son of former All Japan wrestler Mitsu Hirai, in 8.37-2. Fumihiro Niikura and Apollo Sugawara and Goro Tsurumi beat Akira Katayama and Kenichi Oi and Don Arakawa in 13.22 when Niikura made Katayama submit to a face lock, 3. In a PWF match, Minoru Suzuki made Wellington Wilkins Jr. submit in 140 to an armlock. The PWF match looked out of place to fans that were either there to see mainly hard Japanese style or WWF showmanship style. 4. Samson Fuyuki and Takashi Ishikawa and Kabuki beat Tatsumi Kitahara and Shinichi Nakano and Kendo Nagasaki in 1429 when Fuyuki pinned Nakano with a small package. 5. Masakatsu Fanaki made Jerry Flynn submit in 518 with a chicken wing cross face lock in a PWF match. 6. Ultimate Dragon, Yoshihiro Asai making his debut in Japan, as a masked wrestler, beat CMLL World Light Heavyweight Champion Jerry Estrada in a non-title match in 10-15 using a double wrist lock, into a German suplex as the finisher. This match was said to have been one of the best matches on the show, but disappointing considering who was involved, 7. Davy Boy Smith and Ashura Hara beat Haku and Yoshiaki Yatsu in 16-57, when Smith pinned Haku with a small package. On paper this looked to be one of the better matches on the card because Hara, Haku and Yatsu work very brutal and stiff matches but I'm told it dragged, 8. George and Shunji Takano beat Shawn Michaels and Marty Jannetty when Jannetty came off the top ropes with a splash but George got his knees up. George pinned Jannetty in 10.55, and after the match the Rockers did a split up in the ring but to a lot of fans it looked bad because they went back to the same dressing room, 9. Ted DiBiase pinned Kerry Von Eric when Von Eric had sensational sherry in the claw, Ted caught him from behind with a knee to the back, then used the DDT on him in 9.18. This was a bad match and apparently there were a lot of catcalls at DiBiase, who was a big name for years with All Japan, 10. Naoki Sano won the newly created WWF slash SWS Junior Heavyweight Championship by pinning Rick Martel in the tournament final in 7.29 with a German suplex in a disappointing match, 11. Yoshiaki Fujiwara made Ishnariki submit in a UWF style versus traditional style match in 11.12 with an arm lock. This match had the most wrestling heat on the card, but it also didn't interest a lot of fans. According to one report, even though it was exciting because Ishinriki had a lot of charisma and Fujiwara is a great veteran worker, it was evident Fujiwara was carrying Ishinriki and could finish him off at any time and as soon as the 10-minute call was made, he just put him away like it was nothing. After the match Ishinriki, who is 30 but a pro wrestling rookie, he was a very popular and charismatic undersized sumo wrestler before going into pro wrestling this year, announced his retirement. He had started out hot, but suffered a few serious injuries and those, combined with kidney problems, caused doctors to tell him he needed to quit pro wrestling so really he just came back after months off for this one match, and was said to be done to around 180 pounds. 12. Legion of Doom beat Natural Disasters in 9:15 when Animal pinned Typhoon after Hawk gave him a clothesline off the top rope. Most of the patented Road Warriors moves weren't a part of this match because of the size of their opponents, but they received a huge fan reaction. 13. Hogan pinned Tenryu with two axe bombers, clotheslines, in 1357. They worked out a spot near the finish in order to give Tenryu credibility while he was doing the job. They did the 1983 spot where Hogan clotheslined Tenryu, who was standing on the apron, and Tenryu did the cactus jack bump on the floor. That was the move that put Inoki out of action for several months and he never got up. So Tenryu got the big pop because he got up and back in the ring from the move, before losing. After the match, for the first time since his return to Japan with the WWF, his post-match posing routine finally got over big, in fact, everyone said it was the highlight of the match and got the biggest crowd reaction of the show. WCW released all 40 names for its Lethal Lottery slash Battle Bowl pay-per-view show on December 29th from Norfolk. Names that will be picked out of a hat to determine blind draw tag team matches with the winners advancing into a two-ring battle royal are, PN News, Diamond Dallas Page, Tracy Smothers, Terrence Taylor, Brian Pillman, Sting, Larry Zabishko, Sergeant Buddy Lee Parker, Richard Morton, Big Van Vader, Chip the Firebreaker Arachnaman, Rick Rude, Van Hammer, Mike Graham, Bill Kazmaier, Marcus Alexander Bagwell, Lex Luger, Tom Zenk, Abdullah the Butcher, El Gigante, Todd Champion, Rick Steiner, Scott Steiner, Mr. Hughes, Ron Simmons, Thomas Rich, Steve Austin, Big Josh, Steve Armstrong, Johnny B. Bad, Diamond Stud, Dustin Rhodes, Hectus Jack, Ricky Steamboat, Bobby Eaton, Arnold Anderson, Jimmy Garvin, Michael Hayes, and Jushin Liger. What does all this mean? Well, we don't have a hat here, but a box will do and let's put all 40 names into it and draw and see what kind of a card we can come up with. Odds of this being the same card they will have are something like 16 billion to 1, 
but this at least gives us some kind of an idea of the caliber of matches they may be having. 1. Bad and Pillman vs. Arachnaman and Rude. It sounds a little weird, but pretty decent. And who would you put over? 2. Simmons and Hammer vs. Morton and News, another bizarre match, which actually sounds pretty bad. 3. Hughes and Page vs. Austin and Steve Armstrong, all heels. 4. Rich and Bagwell vs. Eaton and Parker, each. On a pay-per-view show. 5. Vader and Chip vs. Garvin and Zank. This idea is getting less and less interesting every time a name is picked out. 6. Zabishko and Steamboat vs. Kazmaier and Sting. Actually if they handcuff Cast to the corner and let Zabishko did all his work with his mouth this is kind of intriguing. 7. Taylor and Scott Steiner vs. Rick Steiner and Abdullah, can you believe it? The odds must be 20 to 1 against Rick vs. Scott and here it is. This is a somewhat intriguing match but it's also obvious which guy is coming up goose eggs out of this one. 8. Luger and Cactus Jack vs. Smothers and Anderson, also kind of intriguing. 9. Graham and Hayes vs. Liger and Josh, what a waste of Liger. Hopefully they'll do better than this. 10. Rhodes and Champion vs. Higante and Stud. Guaranteed they'll do better than this for Dustin. I think we can just about guarantee Todd Champion won't wind up as his partner. Anyway, looking at all this, there is some potential for interesting matchups, particularly since they aren't really going to blind draw the thing and hopefully they'll be booked with ideas in mind that will maximize the effectiveness of the talent. As for the Battle Royal, with very few exceptions, every time I watch a Battle Royal I come out of it with a feeling that if I never saw another Battle Royal for the rest of my life, I'm not going to be missing anything entertaining. My feeling is without any direct matches to promote, the show is going to draw an audience limited to those who will order every pay-per-view show no matter what, an audience that is quickly dwindling, but will be bolstered a very small amount by the fact that the week after Christmas seems to be an opportune time for a pay-per-view show. And at least they aren't going head-to-head with the seventh game of the World Series. According to a press release-style article on the BW Sportswire sent on Monday, UWFI show on December 22nd from Tokyo Sumo Hall will air, working with Braverman, Boxing, Productions, on national television in early 1992. The event billed in the United States as Battle of the Champions, according to Braverman Productions, will air on pay-per-view on a tape delay and then will be offered to ABC, Fox or NBC, offered to be in the key phrase. According to the release, there will be no fun and games at Japan's new sumo arena on December 22nd. This sport is very real and very dangerous. The results should well cast a light on the often asked questions who could beat who. Which fighting sport will be victorious? According to the story, mixed matches have taken place three times between boxers and wrestlers, and the story claims in 1939, Jack Dempsey fought and defeated well-known wrestler Cowboy Luttrell in one round, that in the 1950s Buddy Rogers had a fiasco match against Jersey Joe Walcott and 1976 as a sold-out Shea Stadium saw Ali vs. Inoki from Tokyo and Andre the Giant vs. Chuck Wepner. Actually Shea drew about 32,000 fans for that show, and the main draw was Bruno Sammartino vs. Stan Hansen in a grudge match and at the time Sammartino's MSG bouts were regularly drawing 20,000 anyway. The story called Ali Inoki a sham, as we've talked about here, it was a sham in that it wasn't much of a fight, but it was a shoot, and said Andre vs. Wepner was enjoyable and laughable but totally devoid of any competitive nature. Gary Braverman wants to bring this style of mixed matches to the United States and the story claimed he already has commitments from Roberto Duran, Michael Dokes, Bonecrusher Smith and Jose Ribalta for a show in either April or May. The complete Battle of the Champions card will be headlined by a 10-round Nobuiko Takata vs. Trevor Burbick, former WBC World Heavyweight Boxing Champion, match, a 10-round Billy Scott, pro wrestler from Tennessee, vs. James Waring, IBF current World Cruiserweight Boxing Champ, Kiyoshi Tamura, UWFI wrestler, vs. Bob Backlund in a one-fall submission style match, a 10-round kickboxing vs. wrestling match with Makoto Oi, UWFI, vs. Vince Ross, Canadian kickboxer, plus three prelim matches. For the record, it should be noted that these matches will all, no doubt, be worked. Gordon Scozari's American Wrestling Federation debuted this past weekend with a live show Saturday night in Asbury Park, New Jersey and a television taping Monday night in Lowell, Massachusetts. Scozari, who apparently received a six-figure inheritance and is using it to bankroll an indie, lost a huge chunk on the first weekend noted mainly for unpredictability, in that nobody knew what was going to happen next, and no shows, which included one of the bookers, the Gilbert. Gilbert missed the first show because the promotion had sent him a plane ticket from Atlanta, his home, New Jersey when he had told them he needed a ticket from Dallas, since he was working Friday night in Dallas. Further problems with plane tickets led to him missing the television taping as well. 
the list of others who were advertised and not there was long, but there were a surprising number of names that were there including TNT from Puerto Rico, who I believe was making his US debut, and looked pretty impressive. The December 16th television taping had 450 in the building, although there were 1,059 tickets sold. The singles matches were part of a one-night tournament for the AWF title which naturally was filled with indecisive finishes. TNT beat Tom Burton, Sonny Beach and Jeff Gaylor drew Bob Orton and Barry Horowitz managed by Ronnie P. Gossett, Stan Lane beat Phil Bossy, Paul Orndorff beat Chris Duffy, Sabu beat Chris Candido in a good match, Hercules Ayala beat Freight Train by a DQ when Manny Fernandez did a run-in and Ayala juiced and TNT made the save, Adrian Street double count out with Norman, Mike Shaw, Junkyard Dog and Pez Watley beat the Psychos, Fernandez DDQ TNT, Nikolai Volkov and Cousin Luke DDQ Kimala 1 and 2, Sabu beat Bill Wilcox and in the tournament final, Orndorf pinned Lane in a 3 and 1 half stars match to become the AWF champion plus Samson and Burton and Mike Sharp beat Candito and Freight Train and Wilcox, a local wrestler who looked good, and Beach beat Rocky Raymond. The $22,000 television production included a four-camera shoot with one of the cameras on a crane a la WWF and some fireworks a la WCW big shows. I was told it was an enjoyable show to watch from a spectator standpoint since the crowd was hot and some of the matches were good but it was one of the most disorganized shows backstage anyone can remember being a part of. The December 14th show in Asbury Park, New Jersey drew 275 as Candido double count out with Johnny Rotten, Watley beat the defender, Billy Jack Haynes beat Kimala 2 via DQ and Kimala I interfered, Mike Sharp pinned Dutch Mantel, it was supposed to be a time limit draw however Mantel's knee went out during the match and they had to go home. Street beat Cousin Luke in one of the worst matches in history, JYD and Beach and Gaylord beat Tom Burton and Horowitz and Orton, Norman beat Kimala I via DQ when Kimala 2 interfered and Haynes made the save, TNT and Ayala beat Fernandez and Gorilla Gambi, best match on the card because of TNT, and Orndorff beat Al Perez via DQ in a match where both guys worked so it was good. Among the list of no-shows besides Gilbert were Jeff Jarrett, Tom Pritchard, Cheetah Kid, Ron Garvin, Robert Gibson, Steve Williams and Dan Spivey, who we knew about ahead of time because of the problems with Irv Abrams, and Tim Horner. In addition, both Nikita Koloff and The Sheik were at both shows and made appearances, but didn't wrestle. Koloff was paid but had to cancel wrestling because of appendicitis and Sheik for reasons of which I have no idea, although the first night he couldn't work because he arrived late and didn't have proof of an EKG and there are commission rules in Jersey about guys of that age being put in the ring. Stan Lane and Jim Kernett were advertised for the first night and weren't there because they never agreed to do the show because of a prior booking for Joel Goodhart, which was cancelled at the last minute at which point they agreed to work the first show since they had been advertised anyway but there was a similar mix-up with airline tickets as with Gilbert, so they didn't make it. All the guys were paid in full with cashier checks after the first show so if they skipped out on the second show they still had their money. Perez went on the plane to Boston for the second show but was so fed up with how everything was going that he then took a plane home rather than work the show, while Haynes went home to Oregon before the second show claiming a groin injury. Skozari is apparently working on putting together a second taping for January 24th at the Pennsylvania Hotel in Manhattan. I'll be appearing on nationally syndicated radio show Sports Byline USA on December 26th from 11 p.m. to midnight Eastern Time, 8 to 9 p.m. Pacific Time, talking about any aspect of pro wrestling that you wish to discuss. Newsletter readers can call the show toll-free during that hour at 800-421-7529 to ask any questions or make any comments on pro wrestling, past, present, and future. The show runs on the following stations in the following markets, Los Angeles, KBLA, KWNK, San Francisco, KSFO, Boston, WEI, Washington, D.C., WWRC, Atlanta, WCNN. World Championship Wrestling spent most of the past week on a tour of the United Kingdom. The tour was marred somewhat because just a few weeks before it was scheduled to begin, WCW had its TV canceled. Obviously the tour was nowhere near the roaring success of the WWF tour a few months back in which every UK sold out in a few hours. WCW opened with three straight nights in London's 10,000-seat Olympia Stadium. The first night drew close to 3,000 fans, but only about half of those were paid. The second and third nights drew approximately 4,000 and 5,700 respectively, but everyone who purchased a program on the first two nights was then allowed to show their program and get four tickets to one of the next two nights for the price of one so the gates hardly reflect the attendance. In addition, there were another 1,000-plus tickets per night that were giveaways. The five-night tour was actually a sold tour to British promoters who paid $250,000 to run the shows, so from a company standpoint, it was a guaranteed winner of a week financially. The crowd reaction to the matches was said to be very good with lots of favorable comparisons with WWF when it came to actual ring action. 
WCW has also moved in Super Brawl 91 show, which will take place February 29, 1992, from the Taj Mahal in Atlantic City to a 6,000-seat hall in Milwaukee. The move was because WCW needed one day to set up the show, and Donald Trump himself insisted on booking the building on February 28 for a one-on-one basketball game between Kareem Abdul-Jabber and Julius Irving, which may never even take place. So WCW set out to move the show. There was an attempt to move the car to the Riviera Hotel in Las Vegas, but apparently the hotel didn't want wrestling so Milwaukee ended up being the site. Tentatively, the main event for the card will be Lex Luger vs. Sting for the WCW title. This is the first issue of the current set, which will be three issues because of a double issue coming in three weeks. If you got a, one, on your current address label it means that your Observer subscription will expire in three weeks. Renewal rates remain $6 for four issues, $12 for eight, $24 for 16, $36 $36 for 24, $48 for 32 up through $60 for 40 issues within the United States and Canada. All subscription renewals along with results of live matches, news items, awards, ballots, letters to the editor and any other correspondence relating to the Observer can be sent to the Wrestling Observer Newsletter, P.O. Box 1228 Campbell, California 95009128. Fax messages can be sent to the Observer daily after noon Eastern Time, 9 a.m. Pacific, at 408 408- 378-6562. EMLL. The final card of the year at Arena Mexico in Mexico City took place on December 13th headlined by the Mask vs. Mask match with Mascara Año 2000 against Anibal. It figured to be a bad match, but it turned out to be quite interesting. I guess to understand it fully you have to realize that Anibal is 51 years old, and as his heyday was known as a legendary shooter in Mexico. He physically looks good for his age, but moves slowly and carefully like the 30 years of bumps have more than taken their toll and his wrestling is basically terrible. Anyway, he won the first fall in 103 by submission. During the second fall, which was also a quickie, he did a dive out of the ring but sold like he hurt his head on a landing and submitted after being put back in the ring. The third fall was terrible from a wrestling standpoint but great from a booking standpoint. Cien Caras, the group's lead heel and the older brother of Mascara Año 2000, sprinted around the ring and broke a beer bottle over the back of Anibal's head, and never broke stride and he did his best Ben Johnson imitation to the dressing room. If he had stayed around any longer for the fans to realize what he'd done, there would have been a massive riot. Anyway, it looked like the finish when an e-ball, who juiced from the back of his mask, was thrown back in the ring but he kicked out. They did one big move after another and he kept kicking out. Finally an e-ball made the big comeback and went after Mascara's mask. As ref El Pompin, who no doubt is going to turn into a heel ref after this finish, pushed him back off Mascara into the corner, Mascara grabbed Anibal's leg from behind the ref's back and lifted it up really fast to give the ref a low blow which the ref sold like mad. So the ref is down and naturally Anibal is tearing up Mascara and gets him in the submission that he won the first fall with. The ref finally gets up and calls for the bell, teasing the submission but instead King Anibal. Anibal then stood there and a kid came into the ring who looked like he was maybe 12 or 13. Anibal then unmasked, saying his name was Carlos Ignacio Iscarillo and immediately put the mask on the kid who I believe was his son, and pretty much proclaimed from this point forward, he's the new Anibal and that when he grows up, he'll gain revenge for his father, who without a mask looked something like Bulldog Danny Pletches. One and three quarter stars, super storyline but the wrestling was pretty bad. The remainder of the card from bottom to top saw three legendary sons of wrestlers Blue Demon Jr. and Apollo Dantes and El Hijo del Solitario beat Ponzonia and Javier Yanis and Bestia Salvaje in two straight falls in 1751 and one quarter stars, pretty bad although Dantes looked and Salvaje looked okay, Misterioso and Kato Kung Lee and Volador won two out of three falls from Kung Fu and Chacho Herodes, and Blue Panther in 1448 won Lee Pinch Fu. Love Machine, Art Bar, came to ringside on crutches, he was originally scheduled for this match and Lee replaced him, and Panther went after him again breaking the crutches over his knee and destroying him which turned the heat up but good. Love Machine went out on a stretcher for the second straight week 1 and 1 half star, the new Infernalis, MS1 and Prada Morgan and Satanico, won 2 out of 3 falls from Conan and Atlantis and Dos Caras in 1811 when Caras submitted in the third fall. Caras who is one of the leading drawing cards for the rival UWA, Work this card because this was the annual card promoted by the Union with gate receipts going to the Union, in Mexico a very building that runs wrestling has one show per year where the entire gate goes to the Union, and that show has wrestlers cross political lines, so to speak Viano 3, Killer Fishman and Negro Navarro were all also advertised so they probably worked in dark matches. Give Caras credit for being a pro and doing the job in the third fall since he's not coming back to the building and the other guys have to make their living there each week. 
there was a big show on Sunday night in Monterey with an intriguing main event billed as the final suicide match with El Ejo del Santo babyface, teaming with El Ejo del Black Shadow, heel, versus Octagon, face, and Fuerza Guerrera, heel. When the bout was first announced, it pitted the most popular wrestler in Mexico, Octagon, with all three different world welterweight champs, Santo of UWA, Shadow of WWA and Guerrera of NWA, although Guerrera dropped his title on December 6. The rules of the match are that they wrestle a two out of three fall match with the losing team then having to wrestle one another in another two of three fall match and the loser of that match loses his mask. Figure Santo and Octagon are safe here so it'll be one of the other two, probably Shadow, also an Ebal vs. Mascara Año 2000 in their first meeting after the Mask vs. Mask match and Conan and Pero Agueo vs. Rick Patterson, who works regularly around Monterey, and Sangre Chicana. UWA. Don't have results from the December 8th show at El Torreo but the December 15th show was headlined by Mel Mascaras and Dos Caras, and Viano 3 vs. Kanek and Coquina and Fatu. The El Torreo shows had been moved to 7 p.m. a few months back from the traditional 5 p.m. starting time and attendance has been weak. In an ad in the December 13th newspaper the promoter moved the time back to the traditional time and said he hoped it would bring the fans back. The headhunters from Puerto Rico who worked of late for Wing in Japan are now working as heels. The Amavision television show is under a 15-show contract which lasts until the end of February at which time they'll decide whether or not to renew. They had an article in one of the magazines on Danny Davis where they revealed his real name is Daniel Briley and his age is 39. December 12th in Toluca had Kanek and Fishman vs. Kokina and Fatu. Mascaras won the WWA version of the World Heavyweight title from Scorpio on October 25th in Tijuana while El Eo de Black Shadow won that group's lightweight title from Ascari El Gringo in November. Atsushi Onita signed a contract with WWA promoter Benjamin Moore Jr. to cooperate in trading talent and recognizing one another's champions which will form traveling world champions of the WIA, World Independent Alliance. Onita is looking at using this connection to gain talent that works elsewhere in Japan such as El Texano and Silver King, who work for Universal in Japan, Lola Gonzalez, WING, and Santo, Universal. Connect defended the UWA World Heavyweight Belt on December 13th in Mexico City against Coquina. Because of the problems we reported in Juarez, the Wrestling Commission cancelled the promoter's license, when was the last time you heard something like this happening, and will grant a license to two new promoters to run wrestling in Juarez, and we're accepting applications starting this past Wednesday. Japan Pretty slow week to wind down the year aside from the show at the Dome. The biggest card of the past week was the finals of the FMW World Martial Arts Tag Team Tournament which drew 6,815 fans to NK Hall in Tokyo Bay on December 9th. Onita's tag tournament was a very successful tour throughout the country, but the finals, which drew a near sellout, was impressive since the crowd was larger than New Japan or anyone else draws when it runs the same building. In the top matches on the show, Gadmerka Tereshko at the 350-pound world-class woman judoka, beat Megumi Kudo via submission in 7.03, the Sheik and Sabu beat the shooter and Eiji Ezeki in 49 seconds when Sheik threw fire at Ezeki, Miwa Sato retained the WWA World Women's title beating Chris Christopher, billed as a woman boxer from the US. In the fourth round, Christopher four days earlier at Karakuen Hall became the first WWA Women's Martial Arts Champion beating Erika Tsuchiya via KO, Big Titan and the Gladiator and Horace Boulder and Mark Starr beat the Mercenaries, Billy Anderson and Lou Fabiano, and the South Korean Taekwondo team, Chan Sun Moon and Kim Shun Ki, in a match to determine which team. Both were tied for second place in the tournament, went to the tournament finals against the Soviet judokas, Onita and Tarzan Goto beat Samba Asako and Riki Fuji and the tournament final saw Onita and Goto beat Gregory Varichev and Koba Krutanais in 11.04 when Onita pinned Krutanais. Final tournament standing saw 1. Onita and Goto, 2. Varichev and Krutanais, 3. Asako and Fuji, 4. Gladiator and Titan, 5. Leon Spinks and Rufus Blackbone, 6. Sheik and Sabu, 7. Boulder and Star, 8. Katsuji Ueda and Calypso Jim, 9. Mercenaries, 10. South Korean Taekwondo Team. The new wing promotion debuted on December 10th at Tokyo's Karakuen Hall but failed to sell the building out, drawing 1,535 fans, tickets $39 to $62, to see the return of Mil Mascaras after being away from Japan since 1986. I'm told the crowd was there mainly for Mascaras, who teamed with Waterman, Ricky Santana to beat Miguelito Perez, jumping from New Japan and subbing for TNT, and Mr. Pogo and after the match Pogo had a falling out with manager Victor Quinones so Pogo will turn into the group's lead babyface. Hard to believe a group can build itself around Pogo, 
but it's hard to believe so many promotions can survive in Japan as well. Also Mitsutaru Tokuda beat Yukihiro Kanemura, Gypsy Joe and Dragon Master Gary Rich beat Texas Hangman, Bull Payne from USWA and his partner, Scotty the Body, Scott Anthony, beat Masaru Toy plus All Japan Women Yumiko Hata and Suzuka Manami beat Atsuko Mita and Manami Toyota. The Japanese wrestlers from this group are now touring South Korea along with the JWP women. The only no-show on the card was Eddie Gilbert. The other half of the split-wing group called WMA has a TV studio card on December 23rd with WMA Japanese wrestlers taking on Korean karate guys. One of the matches pits Masashi Aoyagi, who works for New Japan doing the karate gimmick against Lee gak who used to work for FMW as their light heavyweight champion, and a December 26th show at Karakuen Hall. The angle involving Hiroshi Hazi and Tiger Jeet Singh is a little different than I thought it would be. They aired Hazi going to Inoki's office in the Japanese Senate asking for the match at the Tokyo Dome on television a few weeks ago. Hazi went to Toronto to meet with Singh but the end result is that they'll be having a Hazi vs. Singh jungle match at Gan Ryujima, where the famous 1987 match with Antonio Inoki vs. Masa Saito two-hour-long jungle match took place, with the winner, Singh, of course, meeting Inoki on January 4, 92 at the Dome. The only way to win the match is via surrender. New Japan on December 10 in Hamamatsu drew a sellout 3,260 as Shinya Hashimoto and Riki Choshu and Tatsumi Fujinami beat Kim Duke and Tim Horner and Bam Bam Bigelow when Hashimoto pinned Horner, Masa Saito and Keiji Muto beat Brad Rangans and Scott Norton, Shiro Koshinaka and Masa Chono beat Osamu Kido and Kengo Kimura, Negro Kasas and Norio Onaga and Hiro Saito beat Jushin Liger and Kantaro Hoshino and Akira Nagami, Frank Anderson and Black Cat beat Mishiyoshi Ohara and Kunyaki Kobayashi and Aoyagi beat Koji Kanemoto. December 13 in Mito drew 2180 as Hashimoto and Chono and Fujinami beat Duke and Rangans and Norton, Cho Shu and Masa Saito beat Bigelow and Masanobu Kurisu, Liger and Muto beat Kasas and Horner, Anaga and Hiro Saito beat Hoshino and Nagami and Aoyagi and Kobayashi and Koshinaka beat Anderson, and Kido and Kimura. December 14 in Kawasaki drew 3,510 as Chono and Masa Saito and Choshu beat Duke and Horner and Norton, Fujinami and Muto beat Hiro Saito and Bigelow, Kido and Kimura beat Koshinaka and Nagami. Anderson and Hashimoto beat Rangans and Kurisu, R won the Young Lions rookie tournament over all the other rookies to earn a match in the opener of the Tokyo Dome card against Black Cat and Liger and Cat and Hoshino beat Katana and Kasas and Aniga. Itsuki Yamazaki announced she'll be retiring with her final match on December 22 at Karakuen Hall. Yamazaki, who retired a few years back from All Japan Women, made her comeback and is quitting two weeks shy of her 26th birthday, ending a 10-year career. Yamazaki, who is retiring to get married, was most famous in the late 1980s as part of the Jumping Bomb Angels tag team with Norio Tatano, who retired earlier this year from All Japan. The main event of the card is Yamazaki and Harley Saito vs. Dynamite Kansai and Eagle Sawai. Next JWP tour is January 9th to January 26th with Rockin' Robin, Pink Cadillac, Cheryl Russo, Dementia, and Magnificent Mimi. The actual attendance for the closed circuit showings of the All Japan Tag Team Tournament Finals was 3,907. Jumbo Tsurita defends the Triple Crown on January 28th in Osaka against Stan Hansen. Dot Bestia Salvaje and Commando Russo from MLL will be on the SWS January Tour along with WWF wrestlers Berserker, Davy Boy Smith, and Shawn Michaels. The All Japan Television Show which aired last weekend, December 8th, drew an all-time record for the time slot 7.0 rating for a show headlined by Terry Gordy and Steve Williams vs. Stan Hansen and Danny Spivey. The ratings for All Japan from 12.30 a.m. to 1.30 a.m. of late have been so strong that Nippon TV may be considering moving it back to prime time in the spring. New Japan on December 7th drew a 6.3 rating headlined by Hazi and Muto vs. Norton and Hashimoto. The All Japan Women WrestleMarine Piad 3 show aired Monday night from 2 a.m. to 3.30 a.m. Billy Scott, who has the mixed match against James Waring on the UWFI show on December 22, is 22 years old, from Nashville, has been wrestling for two years and is announced at 5 foot 10, 198 but you can generally take off an inch or two and 10 to 15 pounds from that. Waring has a 12 to 1 record with 8 knockouts as a pro boxer and before that was a kickboxer with a 19 to 1 record and 11 knockouts. Luthez will referee that match. All Japan women first two shows of 1992 are January 4th at Karakuen Hall with Bull Nakano and Bat Yoshinaga vs. Asia Kong and Bison Kimura, Manami Toyota vs. Tashio Yamada and Kyoko Inoue defends her IWA title against Akira Hokuto, bring out the calculators to determine the stars in this match. On January 5th Takako Inoue and Marco Yoshida defend the Japanese tag team title against Devi Malenko and Seik Hasegawa. 
Final Tag Team Tournament standings for All Japan Women were, 1. Yamada and Kyoko Inoue, 5-1-1-2. Kong and Kimura, 4-2-1-3. Hokuto and Nakano, 4-2-1-4. Yoshinaga and Yumiko Hara, 3-3-1-5. Toyota and Mita, 3-2-2-6. Yoshida and Takako Inoue, 3-4, tied with Malenko and Suzuka Manami, 3-4-8. Mima Shimoda and Miori Kamiya, 1-6. Next FMW Tour starts December 5th with the Sheik, Big Titan, Gladiator, Boulder, Star, Kevin Sullivan, who should do great as a regular with this group, Jim Peterson and Rob Van Dama, Rob Zakowski. USWA. December 9th in Memphis at the Mid-South Coliseum drew 600 fans as Spirit of America, Randy Lewis, beat Tony Falk, Bart Sawyer drew with Tony Anthony in a babyface match, Candy Man, Reggie B. Fine, pinned Doug Masters. Eric Embry beat Tom Pritchard to regain the Southern title in a match with Falk's hair at stake, Kimala pinned Jerry Lawler to regain the USWA title and Lawler was pinned after being hit over the head with the surfboard by the Sandman, and Moondogs Larry Spot Booker and Bill Spike Smithson, retained the USWA tag team titles beating Jeff Jarrett and Robert Fuller when Spot came off the middle rope with a bone to the throat on Fuller who was injured, and will be taking a few weeks off. December 14th in Jonesboro, Arkansas drew 150 as Sawyer drew Masters, Spirit pinned Falk, Embry pinned Pritchard, Moondogs beat Jarrett and Anthony via DQ and Lawler pinned Sandman. On television on December 14th, Sawyer wrestled Spot in a match where Masters and Spike both interfered for the DQ, Anthony wrestled Sandman in a match which saw Sandman DQ'd for hitting the ref with his surfboard and Lawler made the save. Embry was supposed to wrestle Pritchard in a return match for the Southern title but before the bout started, CJ Embry's valet hit Pritchard with a loaded purse and all of a sudden Miss Texas came out and jumped on CJ but Embry made the save and threw Miss Texas over the desk and her top fell off. With Pritchard injured, Jarrett took the title match with Embry which ended with Moondogs interfering for the DQ and beating on Jarrett until the mystery partner, Awesome Kong, made the save, you know things are bad when Awesome Kong is being brought in as a mystery partner. Eddie Marlin was so mad about the DQ finish of the title match that he ordered a rematch on the same show. Before the match started, CJ jumped Miss Texas while she was doing an interview and Embry got involved and I believe Miss Texas even juiced. Finally came the return title match which went about 7 minutes before television time expired and it was a draw. December 16th in Memphis had Candyman vs. The Shadow, Anthony vs. Falk, Masters vs. Sawyer, Spirit of America vs. Coco Ware, Lawler vs. Sandman, Embry vs. Pritchard for the Southern title with the women in the corners and Moondogs vs. Jarrett and Kong for the tag team title. GWF December 13th at the Dallas Sportatorium drew 900 fans as Eddie Gilbert pinned Ben Jordan, Bill Irwin pinned Sweet Daddy Falcone when Stander Akbar's interference backfired in the first of a series of three matches between the Coast to Coast Connection and the Wild Bunch with the winning side getting to split $10,000. Chaz and Tug Taylor beat Tom and Mike Davis in an elimination tag team match. Tug was DQ'd in the first fall for hitting the ref, Chaz rolled up Mike to win the second fall and the Taylors won the third fall when Mike interfered for the DQ. Next came Jerry Lynn beating Barry Horowitz in a match which saw both men knocked out and the ref ruled the first to his feet would win. Horowitz actually got up first, but the ref missed it then collapsed so Lynn got up to win. Horowitz then wrestled a second match in a row against St. Houston and was pinned again. Baby Doll kept flirting with Horowitz during the match which would cause him to lose his composure and the advantage every time. Finish saw Horowitz on the top rope and Baby Doll started flirting, Horowitz lost his balance, crotched himself, and was pinned. John Tatum pinned Rattlesnake to even the best of three series Dark Patriot, the Gilbert, pinned Jordan Bullpain beat Houston by a DQ when Payne sprayed Houston in the face with something Samantha had brought to the ring and Samantha and Baby Doll fought, Lynn pinned Jordan, Rod Price pinned Black Bart so the heels took the best of three series when Akbar tripped Bart. After the match Tatum came in with scissors and cut much of Bart's beard off, the real reason for this is that Bart's regular job working at a nuclear power plant required him to not have a beard, so they decided to work a wrestling angle around it. After a match, the babyfaces challenged the heels to a six-man tag team match double or nothing. Finale saw Terry Garvin pin Gilbert in a non-title match, which mistakenly on the billboard outside the arena and on the hotline during the week was billed as a TV title match. The win was to build up toward a Gilbert vs. Garvin TV title match next week. December 20th as Taylors vs. Davis Brothers in a strap-on-a-pole match, Tatum and Price and Falcone vs. Irwin and Rattlesnake and Bart in the double or nothing match, Gilbert vs. Garvin for the TV title, Dark Patriot vs. Terry Daniels, and Scott Putsky vs. Stephen Dane. Gilbert is now referring to the GWF during interviews as the Gilbert Wrestling Federation. 
December 27th will have a five match card with every match being a two of three fall title match with Rockin' Robin vs. Casey Houston for the newly created women's title, Patriot vs. Scott Anthony for the North American title, a tag team title match with Tatum and Price vs. two of the Wild Bunch, Erwin Bart Rattlesnake. In a bunkhouse match, Lightning Kid vs. Jerry Lynn in a match where Kid can only win his falls with a lightning strike and Lynn with a sleeper in Gilbert vs. Garvin for the TV title with the fans getting to search Gilbert before the match for foreign objects. Bruce Pritchard, formerly Brother Love, will be in doing babyface color commentary shortly. Pritchard won't be doing anything reminiscent of the Brother Love character. Bernie Fargo won't be doing any more color commentary. Here and there. Larry Sharp is looking for a trainer in the Tampa area for his new monster factory that will be opening around April 5th. For more info you can call 609-423-8255 or write to Monster Factory, P.O. Box 291386, Tampa, Florida 33687. The PWF, Pro Wrestling Fujiwara, show at the Knight Center in Miami will be March 21, 1992. The Inside Edition television piece with the interview with superstar Billy Graham at press time was now being moved up to airing on Friday, January 3rd. The piece will also include interviews with Bruno Sammartino and David Schultz. I'm not certain what aspect of the steroid story will be the one focused on, but there is a good chance the subject matter will be Hulk Hogan's honesty. ABC TV's 2020 is working on a steroids and wrestling piece as well for sometime early in 1992, most likely for the February sweeps. The latest on the commission bill in Florida is that the legislature agreed to continue to look at the issue in a meeting last Tuesday and there will be a mid to late January meeting that will probably be the most lively to date, with a full-fledged hearing. I'm told that the aspects of the actual bill introduced that I was against are in some ways overreaching in order to fall back on strong compromise positions when it gets debated. Some of Larry Sharp's students at the New Jersey Monster Factory competed in a shoot sumo wrestling style tournament against Korean sumos. The Korean group actually first contacted the WWF and you can figure what their response was. Sharp sent four students who were at around the 300-pound mark, but since they weren't familiar with the style, they all lost in the first round. Iqua on December 12th in Tampa drew 200. It was announced that the Lone Riders, Tex Salinger and Billy Mack, had lost the tag team titles to the Terminators, Mark Laurinaitis and Al Green, before the show. Anyway, Jumbo Barretta beat Rob Van Dama, Rob Zakowski, Coconut Man beat Mark Starr via decision after they went to a 20-minute draw, Terminators beat Star Riders to keep the tag team titles, Man Mountain Dean challenged everyone in the audience, and they were saying they had a guy 7-2, 610 named Tex Austin who would be coming in to face him, Jimmy Backlund beat light heavyweight champ Pat Tanaka in a non-title match, Kenny Kendall no contest with Tommy Starr when Kevin Sullivan attacked Starr, and Lou Perez beat Sullivan via DQ when Terminators attacked Perez and Starr Riders turned face by making the save. Next week is the finals of the tournament for the Florida title with Dick Slater vs. Barretta, while Al Perez is coming in late in the month. Owen Hart is definitely not appearing on Joel Goodhart's January 2 May 92 show in Philadelphia against Shiro Koshinaka because of his WWF commitments. Ben Masters ran a show on November 27th in Cordell, Georgia before 325 fans as Bob Armstrong beat Mr. Atlanta, Tony Zane, Junkyard Dog beat Shaska Watley via DQ, Ronnie P. Gossett beat Daddy O, Jimmy Powell, The Blazers, R.D. Swain and Sugar Ray Lloyd, beat P.Y.T. Frederick, Fred Avery, and Night Stalker, Ryan Clark. Mike Golden, with valet Bouncing Betty, beat Rex King, with valet Vivacious Veronica, and Scott Armstrong drew Scotty the Body. December 7th in Ashburn, Georgia drew 275 as Daddy O beat Gossett in a cage match. Ranger Ross beat Mr. Atlanta to win the USA title, Golden and Betty DDQ John Michaels and Veronica. Mark Lewin's shows in Singapore on December 5th through December 7th were a big financial success as the three days drew a total of 11,000 fans to Singapore Indoor Stadium with an average ticket price of around $50 for a tour that included Pat Tanaka, Kendo Nagasaki, Jim Powers, Junkyard Dog, Ken Patera, Bad News Brown, Coco Ware, Demolition Axe, Smash, and Crush, Boris Yukov, One Man Gang and others. Mike Tenney has a weekly wrestling radio show on Craig, 8.40 a.m., out of Las Vegas which can be picked up easily in Southern California from 6 to 7 p.m. Pacific time on Saturday nights. It's also available nationwide on the Sports and Entertainment Radio Network. Guests this week are Dick Bayer, The Destroyer, and Chris Cruz. Henry Hubbard ran a show on December 13th in Jefferson City, Missouri before 78 fans headlined by Paul Orndorff, Junkyard Dog, and Rufus Jones. Dot December 14th at the Portland Sports Arena saw Playboy Buddy Rose return and beat C.W. Bergstrom, the grappler beat Al Madrill via DQ, 
Steve Dahl beat Dirty White Boy, Bobby Blair, via DQ, Brickhouse Brown beat Mike Miller via DQ, Ron and Don Harris beat John Rambo and Mike Winner and the finale was an eight-man elimination strap match with Winner and Rambo and Brown and Bergstrom beating Harris Brothers and Miller and White Boy. Joel Goodhart ran a show in Philadelphia on December 7th headlined by Paul Orndorff beating Buddy Landell via DQ. TWA wrestler Jimmy Gennetti, real name Randy Solomon, appeared on Sally Jesse Raphael on Monday on a show with the theme of children who beat up their parents and he talked about how he used to beat up his father and once tried to burn down their house. Goodhart has a television taping set in Philadelphia with Eddie Gilbert, Buddy Landell, Kevin Sullivan, and the Blackhearts. Dennis Coraluzzo and Larry Sharp have a show on January 10th at Monsignor Bonner High School in Drexel Hill, Pennsylvania with Bob Backlund vs. Jerry Lawler and Kimala vs. Dick Murdoch. Pile Driver Promotions debuts on December 28th in Kansas City with a 25-man barbed wire battle royal, Kimala vs. Honky Tonk Man Butch Reed vs. Bob Orton with the winner meeting Jerry Lawler for the USWA title, that he doesn't hold right now, Dick Murdoch vs. Bulldog Bob Brown and a group of St. Louis-based independent wrestlers underneath. Former TBS jobber Randy Hogan, remember the miniature Hogan lookalike with yellow trunks from Venice Beach, is now running a restaurant in Lakeland, Florida called Cedar River South. South Atlantic Pro Wrestling on January 4th in Denton, North Carolina with a television taping that has advertised Wahoo McDaniel, Junkyard Dog, Patriot, Del Wilkes, Vince Torelli, Ken Shamrock, Ivan and Vladimir Koloff. January 11th in Roseboro, North Carolina is the SAP with title tournament with most of the same names except for JYD. Windy City Wrestling on January 10th at the Fairmont Hotel in Chicago tentatively has Bob Backlund booked, while January 11th in Harvard, Illinois headlined by Ron Powers vs. Frank Melson. WWF. Everything is down right now with no cards scheduled until December 26th when they return with shows in Toronto, Niagara Falls, Capital Center in Landover, Maryland and Hershey, Pennsylvania. No results at press time on the December 14th card at Aloha Stadium in Honolulu headlined by Hulk Hogan vs. Ric Flair, but they drew a paid crowd of 18,000, 20,000 in the building, for the show. Speaking of Hogan Flair, thought their MSG match was a solid three and one half stars and the second best match, behind the first one in Oakland, that I've seen the two of them have. With the exception of this past Friday night's card at the Nassau Coliseum, which may be the WWF's best arena in the country right now, the Randy Savage vs. Jake Roberts matches coming off the Cobra Bite and wife slapping angle are drawing poorly. The shows in Boston, Sacramento and Los Angeles all drew the smallest WWF crowds in those cities in many years. TV ratings, on the other hand, were the strongest in a long time coming off the two pay-per-view shows as All-American on December 8th did a 3.0 rating and Primetime on December 9th hit a 2.7. It now appeared that Tuesday in Texas did around a 1.0 by rate, which is in the league with the recent WCW pay-per-view shows, which would be about a $1.9 million gross, give or take a few hundred grand. This past Tuesday night, KGO Radio, the number one station in the San Francisco market for the past 100 years, during its news was talking about how they were shooting some fish with anabolic steroids in a lake somewhere to keep them from repopulating, and when the anchor let off the story, he said about how they were shooting fish with steroids and he doesn't mean they are talking about a WWF wrestler who dresses up like a fish. Coliseum Video is coming out with six new titles which will retail for $9.95, all 45 to 60 minutes in length starting in March. They'll be the first WWF videos made specifically for the purchase market rather than rental market. December 14th at the Boston Garden drew 3,000 as Tito Santana pinned Hercules, Bret Hart pinned the Mountie in 3 seconds, Bushwhackers and Jim Neidhart beat Beverly Brothers and the Genius, IRS DDQ Big Boss Man Virgil beat Skinner with the Cobra, Sergeant Slaughter won a handicap match from General Adnan and Colonel Mustafa and Jim Duggan and Randy Savage beat Jake Roberts and Undertaker when Savage pinned Roberts. Sid Justice is tentatively scheduled to return now on the road the week before the Royal Rumble against Undertaker on shows which will be a co-feature for Savage vs. Roberts. As a double feature, that should do some business. Warlord and Barbarian are being put back together as a tag team. Jimmy Snuka is no longer with the WWF so whatever Herb Abrams has said about signing him to a contract could very well be true. I believe Snuka asked to be released and they let him out of his contract. Stories about Abrams having Hercules are obviously not the case. The item we mentioned last week out of Vancouver regarding the complaint about the Bushwhackers chanting faggot, faggot at the Beverly Brothers which caused a gay reporter to demand an apology was actually something that took place in early November but just made the papers in some cities over the past two weeks. Steve Planamenta of the WWF sent an apology letter to the man who complained apologizing for offending him and also apologized on CBC Radio. 
December 13 at the Nassau Coliseum drew a good house no figures, but probably 8,000 to 10,000 range, as Greg Valentine pinned Cato, Paul Diamond, Hercules pinned Barbarian, Santana pinned Skinner, Mustafa pinned Jim Powers, Beverly Brothers and Genius beat Bushwhackers and Neidhart, Warlord beat Virgil via DQ, Mounty and IRS beat Bossman and Hart and Savage, and Duggan beat Undertaker and Roberts. December 8 in Los Angeles drew 4,500 as Santana pinned Cato, Slaughter beat Ted DiBiase via DQ, British Bulldog pinned Barbarian, Hart made Mounty submit, Undertaker pinned Duggan, Nasty Boys beat Rockers, Kerry Von Eric pinned Berserker and Savage pinned Roberts. December 8 in Sacramento drew 3,500 as Bulldog pinned Berserker 1 star, Santana pinned Cato 2 stars, Slaughter beat DiBiase via DQ when Sherry interfered 2 and 1 quarter stars, Hart beat Mounty via submission 2 and 1 quarter stars, Undertaker pinned Duggan 1 and 1 half star, Nasty Boys beat Rockers 2 and a half stars, Von Eric pinned Berserker 1 star and Savage pinned Roberts in 534 1 half star. Titan is in the process of trying to sell its new bodybuilding TV show called Body Stars in syndication. WCW. Results from tapings at center stage on December 16 for air dates December 28 and January 4 before 400 fans. For the December 28 television show, Jim Ross does an interview with Paul E. Dangerously where they talk about some sort of an incident where Sting gets injured. Every one of Dangerously's men come out in tuxedos and Dangerously talks about finishing off Dustin Rhodes, Ron Simmons, Barry Windham and Ricky Steamboat and Rude challenges Steamboat to a match. They start the Terrence Taylor split from Alexandra York scenario with an interview. Taylor had just won a match with a flying forearm and York yelled at him for not winning the bout with a neckbreaker. Taylor said he wanted to quit the York Foundation and York took her hair out of the bun and said she wanted a private meeting with Taylor which Taylor agreed to. Mr. Hughes jumped PN News and left him laying. Larry Zabishko now has all the jobbers do stretcher jobs for him as they are trying to play him up big as a crippler to set him up for Barry Windham when he returns. Young Pistols did a squash match with Patriots, Chip and Dip, in the audience and after the Patriots ran in and they had a pathetic post-match brawl. On the January 4th television show, Paul E. does an interview comparing Sting to Magnum T.A. Taylor has another match with York in the corner. After the match York says that they worked everything out, at the meeting. Taylor then tells York that he's quitting which got a big baby face pop. I don't know if the idea is for Taylor to be a heel outside the group, which I believe is the idea, or a face but the fans thought he had turned. During the Van Hammer squash, fans were chanting for Ric Flair once again although in this case it was more because jobber Paul Lee is a Flair lookalike than for anything else. Cactus Jack ended up giving Hammer a DDT on the ramp. TV main was Rhodes vs. Anderson which ended with Bobby Eaton, Steamboat, Steve Austin, Wyndham, Zabishko and Ron Simmons all getting involved in the post-match in that order two and a half stars. Tom Zank missed the New Japan Tour with a neck injury. Some disenchantment over clauses in the new contracts regarding injuries. Old contracts had the wrestlers paid while injured. The new contracts being offered only pay the wrestlers for the first two months of their injury. Considering the hard-hitting style this group's professes to want, injuries are inevitable, both minor ones and serious ones. At the same time, I'm sure management wasn't exactly thrilled over Sid Justice taking time off from wrestling while still playing softball and recovering from his punctured lung. TV ratings are staying strong as the December 7th WCW show drew a 3.3 rating with the Rhodes Eaton, Liger Benoit and 8-man tag team matches, main event did a 2.4 and power hour at 2.0. Nearly everyone in wrestling I've talked with pretty much reads this all the same way, that they are showing some good action. Wrestling every Saturday on television that is entertaining to watch, although it is building to nothing which is why they really don't have hot feuds but they do have a lot of good action on television. December 10th in London, England before 3,000 saw Jimmy Garvin beat Steve Regal, a British wrestler, not the American wrestler of the same name, Michael Hayes pinned Diamond Stud, Johnny B. Bad pinned Taylor, Sting and Rhodes and Bill Kazmaier beat Rick Rude and Mr. Hughes and Oz, Steiners beat Anderson and Zabishko and Luger pinned News with his feet on the ropes to keep the title. December 11th in London before 4,000 saw Kazmaier beat Taylor, I wonder what Taylor did in his previous lifetime to deserve all of this respect for his talent, giant haystacks, Luke McMasters, 6 foot 7, 500 pounds, who I believe is champ of the indie group that is the remnants of the formerly popular national promotion in England, beat Regal, that pin news and they shook hands after the match, Freebirds beat Oz and Stud, Scott Steiner beat Zabishko, Rhodes pinned Anderson and Sting and Rich Steiner beat Luger and Rude via DQ. December 12th in London before 5,700 saw Regal pin Taylor, the guy can't even beat a local now, Rhodes pinned Oz, Anderson and Zabishko beat Freebirds, Sting pinned Stud, Rude pinned News, Bad double count out with Kazmaier and Steiners beat Luger and Hughes. They are going to specifically tailor the syndicated show in Los Angeles for the Los Angeles market, 
similar to how the New York show used to be. Tony Chavani will do the show with either Missy Hyatt or Dusty Rhodes as the sidekick. Nothing that outstanding on television this weekend. Steamboat vs. Eaton was a good match with some great spots. Patriots Pistols tag title change was pretty bad. They mixed up signals because on Saturday they talked about the title changes having already taken place and the rematch would be on Sunday, but the bout that aired on Sunday was the title change match. In addition, on the same Sunday show, they aired a match from a long time back with News vs. Hughes where Steve Armstrong was in News Corner as a babyface. No explanation was made and I'm not sure any explanation would have done anything but call attention to how silly the whole thing looked. December 13th in Sheffield, England saw Regal beat Garvin, Bad beat Taylor, Hayes beat Regal, Steiners beat Anderson and Zabishko, Luger pin News, Sting and Rhodes and Kazmaier beat Rude and Oz and Hughes. December 14th in Dublin, Northern Ireland saw Oz beat Regal, Freebirds beat Stud and Taylor, Bad pin News, Rhodes and Kazmaier beat Anderson and Zabishko, Scott Steiner pinned Hughes, Sting pinned Rude in a non-title match and Luger pinned Rick Steiner. The Reader's Pages Steve Sims of 1,427 watts. Dickens Avenue, Chicago, Illinois 60614 is looking for tapes of UWA wrestling on Imavision and gets wrestling from just about everywhere else that he can trade for them. David Grossman of 7,268 Bergen CT, Brooklyn, New York 11234 is interested in selling his collection of wrestling magazines from the 60s and 70s. Rick Harding of 2247 Redbud Street, Culpeper, Virginia 22701 is looking for a regular supplier of All Japan Women and New Japan tapes. Carlos Ray of 996 watts. 45th PL Highly of Florida 33012 is looking for UWA tapes on Imavision and can trade tapes from just about everywhere else in exchange. Chuck Bennett of 431 Madison Street, Petrosky, Michigan 49170 has videos and LJ and dolls for trade. Matthew Wolfley of 777 Park Avenue, Dunkirk, New York 14048 is looking for a video of the December 1 August. 84 TNT show featuring Butcher Vashon's wedding. Jeffrey Jones of 7948 Tower Bridge Drive, Pasadena, Maryland 21122 is looking for a regular supplier of SWS tapes. He can trade his Joel Goodhart tapes in exchange, who tapes Muf and is also looking for photos of Jushin Liger, Ric Flair, and Hulk Hogan. Joe Manna of 277 Brookville Avenue, Islip, New York 11751 has tapes of Jushin Liger for trade. Paul Galand of 66A Portland Street, Portland, Maine 04101 is looking for tapes of the October 28th Flair vs. Piper and the November 30th Flair vs. Hogan matches from Madison Square Garden. Robert Silva Jr. of 169 Cypress Avenue Hashtag 8C, Bronx, New York 10454 is looking for tapes of the August 85, November 85, 686, November 86, April 87, 687, and August 87 Mid-South Wrestling Cards at the Superdome, as well as tapes of the Taylor Chavez, Camacho Rosario and both Leonard Hearns boxing matches. Russ Cress of 787 Andover Road, Union, New Jersey 07083 would like to hear from anyone who trades tapes and is looking for a tape of the final episode of Dallas. Tuesday in Texas. Thumbs way, way down for Tuesday in Texas. A ripoff of mythical proportions. If it was free, it would still be a ripoff. Mine was a last minute impulse buy. I figured five matches in two hours, plus having to justify the nerve of even running a pay per view just six days after Survivor's virtually guaranteed a really hot show. Visions of an angle of the year danced in my head and I didn't want to be excluded. The crowning slap in the face was Tunney's announcement on TV the following weekend. Basically, I paid $12.95 to watch a free Saturday morning television show, since the match in question, which sucked, by the way, didn't mean a thing. This was as atrocious booking as has ever been done. Hey Vince, why not just send the boys out to mug fans in dark alleys instead of pretending to have a shred of integrity? They should also cut out the garbage with the women. It's despicable and irresponsible to differentiate as they do. They portrayed Jake as a heel for slapping Liz while Virgil is a babyface for doing the same thing to Sherry. It blatantly suggests that good girls don't deserve a beating and bad girls do. Joe Colon. Boston, Massachusetts. Tuesday in Texas was nothing more than a WWF fundraiser. Nothing happened that couldn't have been done at house show. It can't be stressed enough how much Ric Flair's impact has been ruined. Best match by default was Virgil and El Matador vs. Ted DiBiase and Repo Man. Worst match, by a hair, went to the steroids Super Bowl. Why did Bobby Heenan announce the entire show like he had been told he had five minutes left to live? What a holiday bargain. A half-price show that lasts half as long as a normal pay-per-view show. 
Matthew Wolfley. Dunkirk, New York. Thumbs up because of the performance of Jake Roberts. The snake biting was a tremendous angle. Jake terrorizing and hitting Elizabeth was truly dramatic. The rest of the show was forgettable and I never want to see another Hogan vs. Undertaker match. How can anyone say what Roberts did as being wrong when on the same show, a man threatened to slug Sherry and the fans and announcers encouraged him to do so? Jeff Benson. Concord, California. Just one question. If Jack Tunney has been reptiles from the arena, does that mean Vince McMahon can only do voiceovers from the TV studio? What an interview Jake Roberts gave after the match, sick and twisted but a great performance. Their problem is that right now there is a lot of attention focused on violence against women in Canada. In the same match, a woman who had cursed Jake out for slapping Elizabeth called Sherry a bitch and cheered Virgil as he was about to hit her. I asked her why. She said Sherry deserved it. When a woman stands up to a man, she's a bitch. When one is victimized and needs a man to protect her, she's a good girl. I know there's some sort of logic in there somewhere. Either way, is something we didn't need to see. I just hope by the time WrestleMania comes around that there's somebody left who still takes Ric Flair seriously. Norm McAvoy. Hamilton, Ontario. After Paragon Cable of Manhattan didn't offer my area Halloween havoc, they screwed up transmission of Survivor Series for many viewers, so I didn't receive it. I did get a tape of it and Tuesday in Texas. By the way, they also won't be offering Starcade in Manhattan, and I'm hesitant to order more pay-per-views from them because of their poor record of reliability. As for the shows, I didn't rate them as poorly as most. I think the resurgence in WCW has caused people to raise their standards again. WWF shows had a free ride for most of this year. While most of the wrestling wasn't good, there was tremendous heat, much more than in WCW. The snake angle has most wrestling fans sickened, but not at Jake Roberts, but at those who booked it. But I gave both shows marginal thumbs-ups. It's interesting that Titan is taping more matches for home videotape only. With the decline of US wrestling and the growing demand for Japanese tapes, improvements in video technology and telecommunications, the videotape is becoming one of the chief vehicles for many hardcore fans to view wrestling. Except for the WWF, which has hidden most of its historical material, the market is dominated by underground freelancers dubbing material copyrighted by others. The quality of the reproductions varies, as do the prices and what is available. How all these wrestling companies, both existing and defunct, in both the United States and Japan let this growing market continue is beyond me. They could easily outcompete all the freelancers by putting out inexpensive and higher quality tapes of their best old product. The tapes would be relatively easy and cheap to produce yet the originals just sit in a bin somewhere while the promoters scratch their heads in search of new revenue sources, spending all their time coming up with gimmicks for 900 numbers. I guess if they're not smart enough to take advantage of their treasure chest of tapes, they deserve not to get any revenue from it. But the 1990s are fast becoming a decade of videotape and the VCR for wrestling fans. Those that fail to understand this may fail to last the decade. Videotapes are indispensable for watching wrestling nowadays. Eddie Goldman. New York, New York. Steroids. How often do they test NFL players for steroids? Is there any test that can tell if someone is taking HGH? There has been a lot written on pro wrestlers that are taking steroids, but what about bodybuilders? What percentage of bodybuilders are on or have taken steroids or other similar drugs? What is the cost for testing? If the tests aren't all that accurate, but if someone is found positive, what penalties are given to bodybuilders as compared to pro wrestlers? Larry Zala. Sandoval, Illinois. DM, after every NFL game, seven players chosen at random on each team are tested for anabolic steroids, masking agents and other drugs. If a player is tested one week, that doesn't decrease his odds, roughly 6 to 1, of being tested the next week. During preseason, every player in the league is tested. Supposedly, players are also tested without warning at random during the offseason but I don't know if that actually occurs as it's said to occur. There are no tests currently for HGH but scientists are working on developing them. There are tests for clenbuterol, but the NFL doesn't test for it, nor is it in the list of banned substances by the WWF. At the professional level, Every bodybuilder uses steroids and other physique-enhancing drugs, drugs to thin the skin, diuretics to rid the body of water bloat, generally in far greater quantities than most pro wrestlers. Pro bodybuilding is divided into two organizations, the much larger IFBB run by Joe Weider and the WBF run by Vince McMahon. The IFBB tested for steroids at some pro contests in 1990, and even though everyone was heavily on steroids during the year, only a few bodybuilders at each contest actually failed the test. Those that did were disqualified from competing, forfeited their places and prize money and suspended. 
the IFBB has suspended some of its biggest and most charismatic bodybuilders, Sean Ray and Tanya Knight, for example, for one year for steroid violations. An Egyptian big-name pro bodybuilder who was arrested on a steroid possession charge was just recently suspended for two years for a violation of IFBB rules forbidding steroids. For the most part, without any announcement officially made, the IFBB dropped steroid testing this year. So their basic policy now is to fill their house organ magazines with anti-steroid rhetoric while publicizing guys who use mass quantities as heroes and role models. And if someone is unlucky enough to be arrested, and the news gets out, then they are given pretty severe penalties. Independent bodybuilding publications are quite critical of the obvious hypocrisy of the IFBB policy, frequently referred to as draconian. The hypocrisy is such that recently there was something billed as the great steroid debate, and it was well known the IFBB wouldn't allow any of its personnel to be involved if Dan Duchesne, the most well-known pro-steroid guru, was involved, so the promoters had to drop Duchesne, who had already signed a contract to appear, from the program. It was also well known that if any IFBB bodybuilder, all of whom used steroids, debated for the use of steroids, or admitted use, that they would be suspended. The WBF has announced steroid testing many times, but to the best of my knowledge, nobody has ever been tested. Most of the pro bodybuilders nowadays are heavily into the HGH in combination with steroids. The cost of a steroid test is about $170. The steroid summary you did at the time of the WWF's first test was extremely helpful in understanding the actual story and options available to steroid users. I wish the mainstream media or sporting press here had ever done a piece on this story reflecting the level and research and understanding of the subject. Sports is very much a sacred cow here, so it is unlikely we'll see such a piece in the near future. I had written a lengthy letter in response to the fellow from the IWA and Larry O'Day regarding the amusement park residency they did in Sydney, but other letters you have already printed from other Australian readers perfectly covered all of my points. Julian Licht E. St. Kilda, Victoria, Australia. National Column. I was talking to some friends on the floor of the Chicago Board Options Exchange yesterday, and we were once again bemoaning the loss of the National and all its great features. It seems that everyone's favorite column in the paper was your Tuesday wrestling column. I've missed reading your comments weekly. I've never seen a periodical come across as honestly as your columns. You noted the entertainment value as well as the athletic value of the big matches and big stars. You didn't favor either organization and you treated the wrestlers with a respect that their own employers rarely did. We really missed out by not having your column when Ric Flair came into the World Merchandising Federation. We've also wondered what happened to the Ultimate Warrior. When he turns up again, will he finally learn a wrestling move? John Torres. Chicago, Illinois. Survivor Series. The show sucked live. They wasted what started out as a hot crowd. They even gave Howard Finkel a standing ovation and went crazy for Chris Chavez. But it went downhill. They got really mad and felt ripped off when it was announced Jake Roberts wasn't going to wrestle and the rip-off ending to the Ric Flair match made it worse. I cancelled my trip to Indianapolis after the show. Paul Nucci. Ypsilanti, Michigan. Best and Worst Matches. In my opinion, here are the best matches of this past year, 1. Debbie Malenko and Kyoko Inoue vs. Esther Moreno and Marco Yoshida, May 26, Tokyo, 2. Hectus Jack vs. A. Gilbert, August 3, Philadelphia, 3. Rick and Scott Steiner vs. Hiroshi Hazi and Kensuke Sasaki, March 21, Tokyo, 4. Rick Steamboat and Dustin Rhodes vs. Enforcers, November 19, Savannah, 5. Tashio Yamada vs. Yumiko Hata, May 26, Tokyo, 6. War Games, 224 Phoenix, 7. Akira Hokuto and Seik Hasegawa vs. Bull Nakano and Bat Yoshinaga, May 26, Tokyo, 8. Akira Hokuto vs. Bull Nakano, January 4, Tokyo, 9. Jushin Liger vs. Hiroshi Hazi, May 6, Tokyo, 10. Rick and Scott Steiner vs. Masachono and Hiroshi Hazi, 6 11 Knoxville, 11. Keiji Muto vs. Masachono, August 11, Tokyo, 12. Asia Kong vs. Manami Toyota, May 26, Tokyo, 13. Doom vs. Barry Windham and Arnold Anderson, December 16, St. Louis, 14. Rick and Scott Steiner vs. Sting and Lex Luger, May 19, St. Petersburg, 15. Randy Savage vs. Ultimate Warrior, March 24, Los Angeles, 16. Jumbo Tsurita vs. Kenna Kobashi, May 24, Sapporo, 17. Bret Hart vs. Mr. Perfect, August 26, New York, 18. Jushin Liger vs. Owen Hart, April 28, 19. Kenna Kobashi vs. Akira Tao, July 26, Matsumoto, 20. 
Volnikano and Kyoko Inoue vs. Asia Kong and Bison Kimura, January 11, Kawasaki. And then there were these monuments to sub-mediocrity. To paraphrase Doug Llewellyn, if someone does you wrong, don't take the law into your own hands, make them watch these matches. One at a time, from beginning to end, 1. Van Hammer vs. Terence Taylor, September 5, Augusta, 2. Bobby Eaton and PN News vs. Steve Austin and Terence Taylor, July 14, Baltimore, 3. John Tenna vs. Koji Kao, April 1, Kobe, 4. Sting and Al Higante and Steiners vs. Cactus Jack and Big Van Vader and Diamond Stud and Abilla the Butcher in Chamber of Horrors, October 29, Chattanooga, 5. Rick Steiner and Missy Hyatt vs. Arnold Anderson and Paul E. Dangerously, July 14, Baltimore, 6. Us vs. Tim Parker, May 19, St. Petersburg, 7. El Higante vs. One Man Gang, July 14, Baltimore, 8. El Higante vs. Sid Vicious, May 19, St. Petersburg, 9. Hulk Hogan vs. Undertaker, November 27, Detroit, 10. Lex Luger vs. Great Muda, 6 12 Knoxville, 11. Hulk Hogan and Ultimate Warrior vs. Sergeant Slaughter and Colonel Mustafa and General Adnan, August 26, New York, 12. Bill Kazmaier vs. Abdullah the Butcher, September 24, Atlanta, 13. Jake Roberts vs. Rick Martell, March 24, Los Angeles, 14. Bobby Eaton vs. Chip the Firebreaker, November 19, Savannah, 15. Sting vs. Black Scorpion, December 16, St. Louis, 16. Bushwhackers vs. Natural Disasters, August 26, New York, 17. Bill Kazmaier vs. Oz, October 29, Chattanooga, 18. Ron Simmons vs. Oz, July 14, Baltimore, 19. Giant Baba and Rusher Kimura and Masafuchi vs. Abdullah the Butcher and Kimala and Kimala 261 Tokyo, 20. Big Josh vs. Black Bart, May 19, St. Petersburg. Paul Hanlon Jr. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Fred Blassie. Recently, the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston presented a two-video program called Andy Kaufman, Wrestling with Identity. The first, called I'm from Hollywood, featured Kaufman's year-long feud with Jerry Lawler. It's supposed to be coming out soon on video and I highly recommend it. Second, they showed My Breakfast with Blassie, and Blassie himself made an appearance with a talk and a question and answer session. Aside from the incongruity of seeing classy Freddie Blassie featured at the Museum of Fine Arts, it was really funny to hear Blassie, one of the most vicious, brutal and ruthless men ever in the sport, and because of that, one of my childhood heroes, describe how much he enjoys working with handicapped children and seeing him get all choked up about his late friend Andy Kaufman. It won't surprise insiders, but those who have never met Blassie may be interested to know that he's a wonderful and warm human being. Bob Lenhart, Boston, Massachusetts. Regulation. I read in Alex Merves' three-count newsletter the extensive story on the proposed Florida regulation of pro wrestling. Following that was an extensive report on independent promotions in the state. Reading attendance figures in the observer of these and other independent promotions around the country, I don't see the figures exceeding 300 very often. That being the case, there doesn't appear to be much money to be made with promoting independent wrestling shows. What effect will some of the mandates proposed by Florida have on the financial health of a small promotion? For some promotions, the razor-thin profit line may be decided by the sale of a corn dog in the concession stand. Recognizing the need for some past due regulations, do you foresee some laws as having a detrimental effect on a new or small promotion trying to make itself profitable? Harry White. St. Louis, Missouri. The M clearly, adding a tax on gate, which itself would amount to only $50 to $80 on most indie shows, requiring adequate security and regulations requiring need for medical personnel will cut into the profit margin of every show by every promotion. The major offices will survive the added cost without any significant problem. It will affect the smaller group's financial health to a greater degree. I recommended a sliding scale of taxation. The smaller the gate, the lower the percentage tax, the larger, the larger the percentage, rather than a flat 5% tax which would give smaller offices something of a break. Better yet would be a separate set of regulations defining major league pro wrestling with a certain set of regulations and minor league pro wrestling with another set, which is something I recommended from the start. Granted, it would open up a whole new can of worms but also would be the fairest method possible without adding so much cost to running small shows that you would threaten the ability of everyone but the big two groups to even be able to run shows. You could make some kind of an arbitrary cutoff such as running a building with a capacity of 1,000 or greater or less and have different regulations for both but that isn't in the Florida bill. The need for adequate security and medical will turn out to be a greater expense of a regulation bill being passed than the actual commission tax.
but some level of what would be deemed adequate security and provisions for medical care really should be there if one is planning on running a wrestling show to begin with, just by the nature of the beast. So if this bill passes, yet, it will have a detrimental effect on everyone's profit margin. Hopefully it can be written where it won't force groups out of business, but that aspect has to be considered. But some of the regulations really should be seen as just part of the cost of doing business to begin with, but it has to be acknowledged that the downside is the possibility that it'll limit the amount of independent shows. Warrior. I was wondering if you could let us know what happened to the Ultimate Warrior. I haven't seen him since SummerSlam. I've also noticed he's not in the opening intro to the weekly television shows. Where is he and what happened to him? David Shala. Merrimack, New Hampshire. DM, for new subscribers, Warrior was basically fired, officially suspended, after SummerSlam for unprofessional conduct. Translation, he demanded the same money as Hulk Hogan for SummerSlam or he refused to appear, which he apparently received because McMahon didn't want to have to change all the advertising or have a no-show in a pay-per-view main event, and demanded a reported $1 million guaranteed contract, which he didn't receive to work only weekends. With the possible exception of Hogan, no WWF wrestler has a guaranteed money contract and acquiescing to the weekend's only schedule would turn into a major problem down the line as far as setting a precedent. Since Vince McMahon didn't want to set a precedent which would have seen future attempts by the next level of stars to get similar deals, he fired Warrior in the dressing room immediately after his SummerSlam match. Warrior was living in Phoenix after he was fired, but I believe he's since moved and aside from a few WCW rumors, which I believe have been blown way out of proportion, there has been little talk regarding what has happened, or will happen regarding him. Wrestling Classics Why are Wrestling Classics limited to videotape? If Nick at Night can run shows like Mr. Ed Greenacres, Bewitched, Dragnet, and Get Smart, why haven't they investigated a program highlighting moments from wrestling's past? Surely the baby boomers remember Buddy Rogers and Dory Funk Jr. hour-long program could view two or three classic matches, as well as interviews from that time period, and maybe reminiscences from the participants. CBS devotes one weekend per season to best of compilations for past ratings winners like Ed Sullivan, MASH and The Bob Newhart Show. It's about time some production company made a deal with either a network or cable service to run 13 episodes as an experiment. Most of the matches would be relatively cheap to acquire. Imagine seeing Madison Square Garden main events from 1972, which haven't been seen since their original airing. I don't imagine this letter will start a torrent of mail but the idea's time is at hand. Sooner or later, there will be a program delving into wrestling's rich past. A wrestling classic television show is a good idea. Jeff Cohen. Great Neck New York. Lucha Libre. It was great to see Chris Adams on Lucha Libre, but Kevin Von Erich looked really bad. Why was he there? Will Art Barr be appearing there in the near future? Will his past catch up with him in a foreign country? Is there a newsletter devoted to Lucha Libre? Also, if good guys are baby faces, are good guys in Lucha Libre baby masks? Kenneth Nisley. Houston, Texas. DM, Art Barr is currently wrestling in Mexico for MLL as Love Machine. I seriously doubt his past conviction will serve as any kind of problem in Mexico. There is a newsletter called Viva La Lucha put out, by Kurt Brown and Dan Farron. For details write to 8707 D. Lindley No. 212, Northridge, California 91325. I was surprised you didn't tell readers about the one-hour show on Mexican wrestling on a few weeks ago on the Discovery Channel. It was part of a series on cult directors and movies from the past. The show highlighted El Santo, and was quite good. What I found most interesting was the response of my wife, who is not a wrestling fan. She found the Lucha Libre style far more exciting, and entertaining than watching either the WWF or WCW. Paul Kotzpachok. Coconut Creek, Florida. Independence. As an independent worker, I've seen some very discomforting things about hardcore wrestling fans. Although I read letters stating fans would like more local wrestling in their areas, I don't see their actions supporting this. Hardcore fans should know above all others that without local promotions, the WWF and WCW will only have inexperienced talent to promote, such as Paul Noy and Mark Merrow. Yet knowing this I've wrestled on shows where there were only 50 fans in attendance. On the other hand, these same fans will drive great distances to see people who can't afford to bring in because we can't gain a following. I'd like to ask for those who consider themselves to be hardcore fans to please support your local wrestling promotion. Mike Kelly. Garden City, Michigan.